So basically the point of this talk is to tell you why this is a problem and what the obstacles are and what's the current solution that we have and why it doesn't work. So this is MaxSat for Temporal Logics, and it's inspired by this and other real-life systems. So in case you don't know, I actually sit in an aerospace engineering department, and this is a real system that I've worked on for NASA. So this is a timeline, and you can see right here is a projected time when two aircraft being controlled by an automated air traffic control system, they're uh, predicted to get too close or lose separation. So there's a loss of separation event. And then this is the timeline that was published in this paper by the automated air traffic control system designers to handle this sort of situation. So there's a automated tool called an autoresolver and another automated tool called T-safe. And there's a human air traffic controller checking things, right? And so they lay out how all of this happens on a timeline. And then they said, OK, great. Um, please verify this. <laughs> We want to make sure that it's never the case that when we have this system that the two planes actually lose separation and bad things happen, right? So, so this is one of the main motivations for this work. Um, and, and by the way, we were very successful at doing this, but it, but it was a bit of a challenge, and I'll show you why. Another motivation for this work is this problem. So this is the problem of controlling a unmanned aerial system, in this case the SWIFT unmanned aerial system, also a NASA system. And in this case, it also has an operational concept. And they wanted to specify things like there is some time at which it will receive a command to take off. And then after that time, its altitude needs to become greater than that of the runway right? at some point on this timeline. And then while its altitude is greater than that of the runway, while it's in the air, right, it, it needs to maintain certain sanity checks to make sure that it's flying correctly. In this case, its indicated airspeed has to be greater than its stall speed this whole time so that, again, the aircraft flies the way we intend it to. So here is a way that we can incorporate that using logic. And we also analyzed this. Here's one that I didn't do, but hopefully you're noticing a trend. So this is actually from the Air Force, and it's an aircraft, uh, aircraft carrier deck scheduling algorithm. And again, it's a timeline, OK? So the theme here is, is that we have a whole bunch of different safety critical systems, and they're often specified with timelines. And we need to analyze these, OK? So how do we do that? Well, we use the logic of timelines, or linear temporal logic, which extends the propositional logic that we've been talking about so much in this workshop with some temporal operators that allow you to evaluate the, essentially the satisfiability of a, of a propositional logic formula, but at every point in time for a series of points in time. OK, so at each point in time, you can think of this as time 0. And we want to know if p is true and if q is true, right? And then this is time 1, and it's a separate question of whether p and q are true, et cetera. And so one would satisfy a temporal logic formula, a linear temporal logic formula, such as next time, if we want to say p is true in the next time step after this one, and we are in this time step, then we would want p at time 1 to be true. right? Um, and similarly, if we wanted to say something like p is always true for all of the time steps, then essentially we have a single proposition formula, but one at every single time step. Okay. Um, Similarly, we can say p will eventually be true, which just means that one of these formulas has to have p. Okay? We could also say more complicated things, such as that p must be true until some time when q is true, and q must be true in our set of time steps. So that looks like this until, and you can see p is true until some time when q is true. And blank means that anything can happen after that. Any other assignments to those formulas still satisfy this. And of course, there's also a button push or release operator. So you can say that pushing button p will release thing q from having to be true. Now, I can choose not to push button P, but if I push button P, then you'll have this situation where P and Q are true at the same time, and Q needed to hold until then, and then after that, we don't happen, uh, care what happens because I've released it. Right? So this is the foundation of linear temporal logic. 
it gets a little interesting because you can see there are little arrows here. So <laughs> these are infinite traces. They have a known star time here that you can think of as time zero, and they go infinitely into the future. Yes? So P until Q is different from P release next Q? Yes. Those are not the same thing. They're not the same thing. I can show you a proof of that, but it's a little long no, lengthier. <laughs> yes. Yeah, in case it helps, release and until are actually logical duals. So not, not A releases, not B is the equivalent is of, of A um, until B. But there's proof of that too, but <laughs> for another time. <laughs> OK, um, and you can think of why are these infinite? Well, you know, think of an air traffic control system, right? That first example, you turn it on at some point, but it's not like you really turn it off. Right? Air traffic control is running all the time. It's not like some finite thing, right? OK. So we can then take linear temporal logic and verify the examples I showed you at the beginning of this talk uh, via the technique of model checking. So I know some people in the audience are extremely familiar, and some maybe would like a reminder. So if you're in the second group, here it is. In model checking, we describe some requirement of the system, right? Like P must always be true, or that the airplanes must never uh, experience a loss of separation. And that's in our formal uh, specification F, OK? And that is our LTL specification in this point, in this example. Then we create some model with formal semantics M. And that's basically a description of how your system behaves. So you can think of this as constraints on the satisfying assignments for your specification F. So you could have an empty model, essentially, where any variable can take on any value at any point in time. And then essentially, you just have plain satisfiability. Or you can say, well, my system works like this. You know, I can only have a transition from this mode to these modes. And so my model M essentially restricts the next assignment of the variables. Right? All right. And then we want to check that M always satisfies F. Okay? Um, and this is a great way of finding disagreements between your system, how it works, M, and your safety requirement, F. And it has been successful in the three examples I showed you at figuring out what was wrong with those so that we could debug them and so that the final systems are, are safe. Okay, now there's sat inside a lot of places here. So there are direct calls to sat solvers in this backend check here, especially if we're doing bounded model checking or using the IC3 algorithm. And there's also sat inside up here because this whole thing only works if your formula was correct. All right, so this is very garbage in, garbage out. And if you put in a temporal logic formula F that doesn't make sense, um, if it's not satisfiable, for example, then you're not going to get anything that means anything out of the model checker. You might get something quite confusing. Um, so more specifically, that point is that if you have that M models F, so if your model checker comes back and says, true, yes, it models F, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the system behaves the way you expect it to, which is the point of model checking. You're trying to verify the system behaves the way you expect it to. Um, and that's because, of course, if F was accidentally valid um, and not F is unsatisfiable, um, then the model checker can never find a counterexample or satisfying assignment for the formula. Um, but it will then return success. But probably, really, it's not success the way you intended. It's probably because your specification is wrong. Okay. And the reverse is also true. So if your model checker comes back and says your system does not satisfy your specification, your temporal logic formula, then this could be um, because F is not satisfiable in general. <laughs> it has nothing to do with your model M. So you could try to tweak M and tweak M to make it uh, so that this works, and you'll never, ever succeed. Um, you'll always get a counterexample. You'll always think that you have failed and that your system is not deployable. But again, it's probably because your specification is wrong. So it's really important, then, to check every specification property F and its negation for satisfiability before you use it for verification, specifically so that we don't run into these problems, right? We have to make sure they make sense. Yes? Don't you use things like uh, and reasons to check why you are satisfied or unsatisfied? 
Ha, ha yes, that's uh, toward the end of this talk. Great intuition. <laughs> yes? Uh, would it make sense because you have an intended behavior in mind when you say, ah, f is true if the following sequence, you have already a test case. It will not have the same. Don't you have that often or uh, good test cases and which already will show that it's satisfiable under these uh, well, so the counterexample is essentially what you're describing, right? So it, it says, you know, okay, in time zero, here's the variable assignment. At time one, here's the variable assignment, right? And it goes through and gives you the assignments for all the points in time. And then, of course, because it's infinite at some time, there's a loop, right, at the end. And so that's the counterexample. But the problem is, is that if your f is wrong, you still won't get a counterexample that makes sense. And it will be very hard to figure out why. Because it's not clear, is it because your f was wrong? Or was it because your system actually has some bug that was really subtle and you couldn't find? So you have this long manual process of going through the counterexample and going through your system and being like, oh, does this make sense? Is it real? So you'd like to minimize that. All right. So in order to do that, we check for satisfiability. Yes? So F is derived by some human based on the timeline. Yes, in this case, right. Yeah, written by a human. So extra fallible. <laughs> Um, and, and one of the uh, very sticky things here is that we also have to check the conjunction of all of the requirements for satisfiability, right? Because it needs to be the case that all of the requirements can be true of the same system at the same time before we go build it, right? So we never just have one requirement for our system, right? We also have a whole bunch of other requirements that we need to check um, in conjunction with that one. And, and this problem actually becomes very, very large. So now you have this huge formula, and you have to check it for satisfiability. <laughs> All right. Um, and the problem is, is that that's hard. <laughs> So LTL satisfiability checking is p-space complete. And that's because if you have a size of your specification f and a size of your system model m, then this is the complexity here. So it's exponential in the size of f. Um, there are many ways to do LTL satisfiability checking. They all are very, very dependent about how you encode the formula, and that affects their performance dramatically. The easiest way to see why this is p-space complete, sort of like proof in a picture, um, one way to do satisfiability checking for LTL is through model checking. And so in that case, you would have your formula here. You would put uh, not in front of it so that you get uh, the assignment that you intended. And then this is the exponential blow up step right here in red. You would compile it to an automaton. And this is the automata theoretic approach that Vardy Volper are so famous for inventing. And then you take the Cartesian product of that with your model M. And in the case of satisfiability checking, it's just the universal model, right? Any assignment can follow any other assignment at any point in time. And then you check whether the resulting automaton is empty using set theoretic and graph theoretic algorithms. There are other ways to do SAT, but they all have the same complexity. So this is sort of the easiest one to understand. Why is this hard? So uh, again, we have to be very picky about how we do the exponential blow up that happens in any of these algorithms. Now, it's also particularly hard to scale this once you have an LTL satisfiability checker. So this is a graph um, of a formula that describes an 8-bit binary counter. So it's not that big or hard of a formula. <laughs> it's human readable. Okay. And these are a bunch of tools for um, essentially checking satisfiability of LTL in coordination with the spin model checker. And you can see that um, they can't check even 8 bits here. Um, and no tool scales beyond about 12 bits. So that's really <laughs> not great when you're talking about, now we want to check a whole really big system, like an air traffic control system, or the control for a, an unmanned aerial system, right? We need, we need satisfiability checks that can scale. They're also really, really hard to code correctly. So that's another problem that we've run into. So this is correctness, um, 
correctness degradation as we scale the length of the input LTL formula here. And so that's 65 characters long for the formula. And again, these are a bunch of tools for checking satisfiability. And they should all be on this line of one of always getting the correct answer, sat or unsat. Um, you can see that there are a couple that eventually do worse than random guessing, <laughs> getting the answer 50% of the time. Um, and at the time when I ran this experiment, sadly, I can tell you these were all the state-of-the-art tools, every single one of them, and none of them had a line exactly on this one. That's not true now. After I published this, of course, there were <laughs> appalled tool authors who went in and, <laughs> and fixed bugs, right? But um, I, I mean, these were all coded by our peers, by you know, intelligent people who planned to do them correctly, right? So this is clear evidence that this is just hard, right? It's a hard problem. All right, and um, the implementation and the encoding of the formula for satisfiability is hugely, hugely influential. So here are all those same tools. And here is timing. And again, we're scaling number of variables in the formula. This is log scale of the median total running time in seconds. And you can see these tools are all running similar algorithms. And these tools are running very different algorithms for encoding the formula. And they're getting very, very different timing results, right? This is all just the algorithms for how do you encode satisfiability, OK? So then taking this one here, this pink line of cadence SMV, um, it turns out after that, we tried to improve on that encoding. And you can see there is cadence SMV again here on log scale, barely off of that axis. And here is the tool we created to encode exactly the same formula and use the same back end. So we're actually running cadence SMV in the back end. We're just running it on a different encoding and input of the formula than the original one. And we got exponential improvement just from that. So there's a lot of room here, and we have to be really smart about how we think about just the input to these kinds of solvers. And this is true even for very hard problems. So this is a difficult formula for humans to understand with a bunch of nested until operators, for example. And you can see here, also, we got exponential improvement just by rewriting the input formula a different way. OK? So all right, we're coming back to then the problem here. Um, for each property, we have to check for satisfiability, right? And we need to check the conjunction of all properties. Now, I've scared you and showed you all of the stuff about why this is hard and, and, and what's, what's the problem here. But we've talked a lot in this workshop about how it's very interesting when you take real life instances that they tend to be easier than the doom and gloom scenario that I can put up here, right? So. Um, is this actually required in real life? And what does real life look like? What do those problems look like for this? Okay. Well, here is an example from that very first verification case study I talked to you about, the automated air traffic control system at NASA. And here is a drawing of a subcomponent of the model that we made for that air traffic control system for the T-SAFE. It's the Tactical Separation Assurance Flight Environment piece of software. And it essentially has these three modes where either there's no alert that planes are about to lose separation, or there is an alert, but it's before the threshold where it's sort of an emergency timing wise and T-SAFE needs to take an immediate action. Um, of course, time can either progress such that you stay before the threshold, or eventually time can progress so that you get after this critical threshold and, and the loss of separation is still projected. And, uh, and then, of course, if you have a T-safe command to the aircraft that resolves this, right, you can go back to there being no alert. Okay? So this is the, the way that we modeled the system. And when we did the satisfiability check of the conjunction of all of the requirements for this air traffic control system, uh, here are two of the requirements that were in that big list. right? So one of these said that all T-safe alerts will eventually be resolved. Makes sense, right? You don't want to have an alert that planes are about to get too close and no one does anything. And then we also have this constraint that there has to be progress between T-safe alerts, right? So we can't just sit there and not make progress in this cycle. We have to do something. 
So the way that we encoded these two English statements, we actually encoded this second one, referring to this submodel, as that T safe alert must infinitely often pass through no alert. Okay? Seemed like a reasonable thing to encode as the humans. Right? So the idea is, is that if you get an alert either here or here, right, it's going to be resolved and you're going to go back to here, and that will always happen at some time in the future. That was how we encoded this constraint. So specification debugging via LTL satisfiability checking actually pointed out that that was the wrong way to encode this. And it's really, really not obvious. Okay? The actual correct way to encode this such that our system is represented correctly is actually just to say that infinitely often we are not in this after the threshold state. Right? Also really not obvious. And how we came up with this was we satisfiability checked the whole thing, and then my graduate student, <laughs> through lots of manual labor, figured out that the conflict was between these two you can think of them as clauses, right? These two requirements in the giant conjunct. And that in particular, uh, we could have all of the requirements and this one, or all of the requirements and that one, but we couldn't have all the requirements and both of them. And then he figured out that that was because this one needed to be adjusted. So this was a hugely time consuming effort, but it's something that needs to be done a lot. So that brings us to, we need specification debugging. We need to answer the question, if the conjunction of all properties is not satisfiable, then where is the problem? And we need to be more efficient at this. Okay. Can you describe the, the wrong trace? The wrong trace? There must be a wrong trace. Right? Well, actually, in this case, it was, it was over-constrained. It was, it was not satisfiable. So we were just like getting this empty result from the model checker, but it was looking funny, and so it was, it was clear there was something wrong and that was there was a lot of intuition that went into the sort of looking funny and playing around with it thing but you know general intuition the first time you run a model checker it should not ever say that everything passes because there's always going to be some bug the first time you run it <laughs> and that's very unscientific but that's what happened here and so then we we're like huh what did we do wrong No, because this is a progression of time. So time only can go forward, right? So I colored the, um, I colored the different transitions in terms of what triggers them. So an alert is red, um, having no loss of separation again is blue, and then time is in black. So you can stay here, you can stay here. Time can progress from before to after the and threshold or stay here. You don't have several alerts in this system because it could be like you resolve one, but yeah, so that's a good question. In this case, um, ooh, what happened? Um, OK, in this case, um, how TSAFE does alerts is it has a total order. So an alert means that there are two planes that are the most in hazard of having a loss of separation. And then once that's resolved, then it has like this sort of reset thing and, and redoes the list and then goes up again. Exactly, and in that case, that's what was happening here, and so that's why this was wrong. But it was really not obvious till we thought about that, right? It's one of these. Exactly, that's that's basically the issue. Is and we thought we had modeled it so that it had like this reset because it always recomputes this list and then sees if there's a problem and yeah, and so that wasn't working with this the way we expected it to. But that's the kind of thing where it's like, wow, that was way harder to find than it should have been. So, OK, so we also want to do requirements engineering on systems like this. So specifically, you get this customer, and they say, OK, if the conjunction of all the requirements, all the stuff I want is unset, then how much can I have? Because usually they say, oh, they're all critical. But as soon as you say, well, you can't have all of them, then they're like, well, OK, there's some I sort of care about more than others. How many of them can I get, right? How much can you give me? Um, and then we talked a little bit about XAI, explainable AI, earlier in this workshop, right? That's the problem of having your system come back and say, I could not solve this because something like the smallest subset of requirements is not compatible with the rest of the set, 
right? And this one is a really interesting problem differently from these because this one you would also care more about performance. You would want, hopefully, for this to return in real time while the system's still running, right? While you could use the information of it couldn't do something because to you know, fix it or give it different input, right? Whereas these are early design time and offline. Yes? Well, so here I'm saying essentially these are sort of all variants of max set, right? More or less. <laughs> and that's why this talk is about max set for temporal logics, right? So, so you get all of these problems in real life, and, and you think about it, and really, if we just had max set, it would be way easier to do all of these things that we want to do. So that's the motivation for this problem. Um, and of course, one other big caveat that I've set up here is that SAT, just one SAT call, is very hard for LTL already. So <laughs> now we want to do max SAT. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so, so what's the next step? Well, we can try to make the problem a little, a little more manageable, right? To try to work toward max SAT. So here is the slide of LTL again. And remember, it reasons over infinite traces. And so when we were thinking of obvious encodings for max set, that, that was making life a little harder. But there are variations of this that don't have this principle. So for example, there's this logic that was invented in 2013. And this is LTLF, or LTL over finite traces. So it's exactly the same as regular LTL, except for instead of having the little arrows here, we have some very definite endpoint. And we don't necessarily know exactly when it's coming, but we know that the trace is finite, and there's this end, and we can test for it, and it will be the end. right? So we tried to see if this made things a little easier. And we needed to break it down one step further. So then we actually went to this logic. Yes? Exactly, right, yeah. Um, and so these logics are used for different things. So this logic, for example, this is mission time uh, temporal logic, or it's temporal logic with finite integer bounds on them where you know exactly when it ends. And this one, not so applicable for the air traffic control system because, again, you're not going to have these small finite bounds. But this logic we use very frequently, for example, for the flying a UAS the second case study I showed you. Because the UAS, it has like a half hour battery life, right? So anytime you want to have some requirement, you want to have that requirement during the mission, or probably during just like the mode of the mission, like while you're at waypoint one, right? These things should be true. You should be above the mountain. You should, this sort of thing, right? So you can see where in real life, we do have instances where we have this logic, um, which is closely related to LTL, except it conveniently has all of these nice little integers. So if you want to say always between time 2 and 6 p, then you just have between time 2 and 6 p, right? And you don't care about anything else. So this logic now, this gives us some very, some very interesting things to work on. And in particular, one of the first things we did is solve an easier problem. So if we have formulas in this logic and evaluators of those formulas, we need to be able to benchmark them. And that is a bit of a problem, because there aren't any benchmarks for this logic as of yet. Uh, hopefully there will be as of this year. Uh, shameless plug for the RV benchmark competition. Um, <laughs> but so what is a benchmark? What does that look like? Well, if you have time here, so we'll say we have um, time is nine units, and it's finite, and we know that, right? We have integer bounds. OK, and then we can have assignments to our variables that happen up here. Then if we're creating a mission time temporal logic runtime benchmark, essentially what we want to do is create a three tuple that evaluates for every point in time is our formula true from that point in time given this single run of the system. Okay. So the way this works is this would be a runtime monitor, like on your UAS, for example, that your indicated airspeed is greater than your stall speed. And you want that to be true for, say, like nine units, right? 
And so you want to say, OK, if I'm at time 0 and I have this one of the system, then is this formula true, yes or no? If I'm at time 1 and I have the run of the system from 1 to 9, is this formula true, OK? So you would have this input stream or computation that we call pi, and that is the valuation of the variables in the system during the current single run. So now it's simplified. You don't have this whole model of everything your system can do, right? You just have this one, one run. And you have your temporal logic formula. And you have an oracle as part of a benchmark, right? Because you're trying to evaluate whether the tool that you're benchmarking gets the right answer. So the oracle has to be time verdict pairs that says, for example, at time 0, yes, it was true. So to give you an example of that, hopefully this will make it a little clearer. If here is our timeline, so we have nine units of time, OK? And we have one variable, A. So our system is running, and here is the assignments stream that gets sent in for A from our system run. Okay. So now we want to create a, an MLTL benchmark. And what we want to do is we want to say, OK, well, our pi, our system run, is then this string of A's and not A's in order. right? So at time 0, we have A. At time 1, we have not A. At time 2, we have not A, et cetera. Right? Just copy that. That's our system run. Then we have some formula. So for example, we want to say that A is true for five consecutive time units. That's our formula. Okay. So then we want to pair these with an oracle that says, OK, if my formula always for the next five contiguous time units A is true um, at time 0, well, it's not, right? Because there is a not A there. So it's not true for five units from zero. So we get zero false. Then at time one, also false, right? Because if we start from here, we don't have five A's, so it's false. Same for time two. At time three, we want to get three uh, and true. Because if we're here and we say always five A, one, two, three, four, five, right? It's, it holds. So we get this and for four, etc. And I'm ignoring the end condition here because there are some you know, obviously corner case details, but this is essentially the kind of thing that we want to produce. And so then, if you're benchmarking or just testing for correctness, any sort of onboard runtime monitoring tool, you would have a benchmark like this, and hopefully the tool always gets this output for these inputs and that formula, right? Um, so this is an important thing that we need to generate. And you can see that there is a pretty straightforward SAT encoding for this. So you can assign some variable a sub i to be that's the proposition a at time i. Okay? So in this case, we would end up with 10 variables in our formula, right? For a0 through a9. And then what we would want to do to construct this benchmark, and for a benchmark, right, this is for a runtime monitor. So we want to get true as often as possible. Because if you think about it in theory, your system's running, and hopefully something bad, which is a false, right? You're not satisfying your requirement. Hopefully the something bad happens never. <laughs> so your entire oracle should be you know, true at time 0, true at time 1, et cetera. Um, and if you do have something bad happen, it should be rare, and it should not happen often. Um, and, and it should not happen for a long time, right? So. So OK, essentially we want to find a satisfying assignment of the propositional variables over all the points in time for our formula at each point in time. Okay, So that's what we're aiming to generate here. So what we would do is then we would first run our SAT solver at time 0, and we would get some satisfying assignment, assuming our formula is satisfiable, right, to points in time from 0. And then to continue constructing this benchmark tuple, we would just conjunct the satisfying assignment we just got from time 0 to running the formula at time 1. So now run at time 1, and we assigned these you know, propositional variables. Now run at time 2, and we assign the propositional variables from runs 0 and 1. Right? And in this way, you can effectively construct an MLTL benchmark with multiple SAT calls. But of course, there's a minor problem, which is that this is horribly inefficient. <laughs> now, it matters slightly less because we're generating benchmarks, so this is not something that has to actually happen in real time if the computer runs for 
a whole day to generate a benchmark, well, you know, you can still use the benchmark however often after this, so it's, it's okay. But uh, we really need to figure out a smarter way of doing this part so that we can have this be more efficient for other harder problems, like say MaxSat. So I leave you with a list of open questions. Firstly, how can we design more efficient MaxSat tools for MLTL? So you can see from the way we're encoding MLTL, right? You could do a sort of obvious, very naive MaxSat encoding. It would be really inefficient, just like our benchmark one. Um, how do we do it better? How do we rewrite this, encode the formula better, so that we have a prayer of doing MaxSat in sort of reasonable computation time? Um, and then after we do that, then can we maybe take what we learned and use that to generate MaxSat solvers for LTLF or just plain LTL? Harder logics that don't have nice finite integer bounds. Um, how would we do that? And then we were talking a lot about heuristics. So maybe there are some heuristics that are specific to uh, MaxSat for temporal logics that we could develop here to make this faster. And finally, I was trying to get a graph from that wonderful tool that Laurent showed during his talk uh, at the <laughs> in the first session of this, but it is apparently not operational. So apparently there's a team of people trying to get the SAT graph going again so I can show you. But for now, believe me, there are shapes to this domain, right? It doesn't look like the random ball where, where you don't know what's going to happen. I, I know someday when we get that tool running, <laughs> I will be able to show you a graph that this problem has a very discernible shape. And it seems like we should be able to use that to make a better solver for this. All right, that's it. Any questions? I gave you no answers, so more questions. <laughs>